Well, that said, Don, we got Tate on the line here. What do you want to ask him? Is there something like that, like a rule of thumb type thing with apartments where you can do like a quick analysis to even see if it's worth your time to do a full analysis? Well, I, I, I think the best answer to this is that you need to become an, a real expert in your market. You need to know the market thoroughly so that when something comes up at 55,000 a unit, you know, that's smoking. That's I, I know I can put 10,000 a unit into that and <laughs> sell it for 85 or 90 a unit. That's kind of a, a rule of thumb. I think a lot of people that are really savvy in their markets will use is a price per unit rule of thumb. So that's one. <laughs> Welcome to the Diary of the Department of Investor podcast. I'm your host, Brian Briska with Four Oaks Capital. I say this every time. I say I'm really excited for today's show, but I really am super excited for today's show. It's one of our Ask the Expert episodes. Uh, two great people along on the line with us today. We have Tate Seamer from my hometown, Salt Lake City, which is why I'm super excited. And Don Spafford from Idaho Falls area, which is where I'm going to be moving soon. So, you know, lots of lots of goodness going to be in this podcast, lots of personal stuff for me. So first thing we're just going to say to Tate first, welcome to the show. Brian, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be on this podcast is one of my go-to podcasts. It's a staple for me. And uh, you know, being a fellow podcast host, mm -hmm. I admire you and, and learn from you all the time. So it's such an honor to be a guest. You know, and, and Tate, feelings mutual. I think your podcast is pretty cool too. You know, from one podcaster to another, you know, you got the apartment guys, um, you know, really catchy name, catchy theme, and, and you guys have done some amazing things too. So uh, actually, why don't you tell us about the podcast real quick? Sure. Yeah. Apartment Guys, it's a weekly mm -hmm. podcast in interview based, and we just have high level experts on weekly that mm -hmm. bring different perspectives from different parts of the business. And, you know, I'll have people on that have 6,000 doors and mm -hmm. half a billion dollars under management. And I'll have people on that are duplex, fourplex owners trying mm -hmm. to get into small multifamily and, and everything in between. And and uh, we just really focus on moving the needle in your business. That's mm -hmm. that's our biggest focus is bringing what we can to you uh, a value that helps move things in a really meaningful way. And you you know your your key metrics, right? Like mm -hmm. like those are the ones that really make a difference at the end of the day. So that's what we focus on. We have a lot of fun. It's honestly it, it's the coolest thing I've ever done professionally, this podcast. It's yeah. um, like a, a creative outlet and expression that I didn't even know that I needed or <laughs> wanted. It's like, it's, it's so fun. I love it. You know, and that, that's, that's true of, uh, of my podcast. I feel the same way at first it was, it was almost a chore trying to get it started. But once I started doing it, I just realized you know, I talk to people anyway, you know, and it, it gives me a chance to bring people that maybe I wouldn't normally talk to, talk to or talk with and, you know, people who are way far ahead of me in the business as well and people who are trying to get started. So a lot of fun as well. So awesome. And, and for anybody listening, we're going to put a link to his podcast in the show notes. Um, so check it out. And incidentally, I was a guest once upon a time. So yep. You know, um, I you know wholeheartedly endorse it. So there we go. So so Tate, let's let's do this. Let's talk about you. Uh, talk about your background and history, and kind of kind of lead us up into what got you into apartment investing. Sure. Yeah. So I'm a product of the suburbs of Cincinnati, Ohio. Mm -hmm. um, grew up there, and and uh, went to high school in Cincinnati, private uh, all guys high school, and then went to college in Ohio, uh, Ohio University got a degree in psychology and then got into sales after college, really didn't have a whole lot of direction. And in 1999, uh, three years after I graduated from college, I moved to Utah mm -hmm. 21 years ago. Um, I moved to ski specifically and Skiing's um, awesome. it's my number one passion in life, mm -hmm. uh, aside from my dog and my family. And, but it's huge for me and, and, was the driving force behind that move. And long story short, I, I'm a photographer by trade. I, mm -hmm. I did a lot of ski photography uh, when I moved out here. 
uh, got into wedding photography very heavily, uh, did that for about 10 years, shot hundreds and hundreds of weddings, have been to all the uh, Utah temples and, mm -hmm. and all the beautiful places out here. It's an amazing place to be a wedding photographer, by the yes. way. Yes. So, you know, in 2006, I was kind of not real stoked on the level of uh, income that I was generating through that gig in spite of working really as hard as I could and knew that it wasn't going to be something sustainable in terms of generating the level of wealth and lifestyle that I wanted. So I mm -hmm. uh, got into a really basic real estate class mm -hmm. uh, on investing, on flipping houses and seller financing. And we learned about cap rates and rental properties and highest and best use and, you know, really all the basics, the fundamentals. Mm -hmm. I started flipping. Um, I, my first project was a duplex, 100 year old duplex in Salt Lake City yep. uh, that I did on my own. I, I rehabbed mm -hmm. one unit, kept the tenants in the other unit and, and sold it. Um, made 10,000 bucks and was on top of the world. <laughs> and um, so did a number of other flips between 06 and 08, got my license during that time. And then the, the crash happened and all of the, it really hit us like right in the heart because all of the financing programs we were using right up to flip were gone immediately. Mm -hmm. And so I, and, and to be honest, I wasn't really like in the groove in that business at that point, I, I was, I felt like I was kind of swimming upstream. It just never really clicked. And so I wasn't real uh, heartbroken when the crash <laughs> happened. I went back to photography for a couple of years and started a yoga studio out here and did some other business things. And, uh, and then in 2011 and 12, roughly, uh, my current business partner and I, Carl York is his name. Uh, we started, back in the single family world flipping again, it was kind of all we knew to do really. And uh, just didn't have a mindset that anything else was possible at that point. And we did that hard for five years. Didn't, again, didn't have, uh, didn't really click, didn't mm -hmm. really get in that, you know, we didn't scale up, didn't produce what we really would like to have. And so we branched out about four years ago, we took on some land entitlement deals. Mm -hmm. We uh, flipped a few apartment buildings, some smaller apartment buildings, and we did some new build, high-end okay. luxury townhomes here in downtown Salt Lake City. And so we tried our hand at about, at really three major different asset types all at once, and <laughs> kind of went big. And uh, in some ways, the, the townhome projects just didn't go well. Um, really? they were uh and we can talk i know don's got questions about stuff that didn't go well and, and <laughs> we'll talk about this a little further but it became really clear to us through that experience that buying existing larger scale multifamily mm -hmm. properties was not only hands down a, a more efficient way to build wealth and passive cash flow but was also actually quite a bit uh, risk yeah. mitigated yes. uh, compared to the speculative nature of building new product and hoping to sell it for $900,000. So it, all of that became very evident just by doing those projects mm -hmm. and by, by being in the deals. And so, yeah, I guess two and a half years ago, we really focused hard and have honed our focus in on larger scale multifamily acquisitions. Mm -hmm. uh, we just really cracked the code this year and nice. um, we cl in the last actually two weeks we closed on 249 units in central ohio between two different apartment communities we've got 363 units in oklahoma city under contract we've got mm -hmm. 51 units in oklahoma city under contract it's it's been an incredible journey i've i've been in, i've been a part of a coaching mastermind with corey peterson mm -hmm. Um, I've been in Adam Adams' inner circle, uh, been to Michael Blanc's Dealmaker Live, yeah. where I met one of my current partners, Chelsea Garber, mm -hmm. who's a, just a rock star right now in the making. And, um, and speaking of, I bet yeah. you we met there because, probably. yeah, we, we probably did because yeah. uh, at that Dealmaker Live, um, inside the the uh, where the presentations were, the, the auditorium area, I was actually sitting right next to her, but... Uh, okay. 
I'm sure I'm sure at some point during that whole thing, we probably crossed paths, shakes hands, shook, shook hands or something. Yep. But anyway, sorry about that. Go ahead and, and yeah, finish. Side, yeah. Quick side note for listeners, yeah. go to those conferences. Oh, guys. yes. Like seriously, and buy the VIP ticket mm -hmm. and just treat yourself to first class treatment and rubbing shoulders with rubbing elbows with the, the best of the best. Yeah, um, you, you can't it's a it's literally it's a priceless experience yeah. to do that yeah. and the uh, vip tickets give you give you access to every other vip most people who are in the business and are doing things are going to buy that vip pass you know and incidentally i don't have a conference coming up where i'm offering vip so that's that's straight up that, that's what i've learned from doing yeah absolutely and i i don't have a conference either coming yeah. up direct i don't even have one well i guess deal maker live is is Mm -hmm. you know it's coming up in july it's going to be live michael i don't michael doesn't know me i've he's not giving me anything to promote the event but mm -hmm. I, you know it's probably the it really is like maybe the one event every year that i think so do not miss there's some yeah. great other ones joe fairless is uh, is awesome uh, Corey's doing one now you know there's there's some really great events yeah. to get to but man was that a needle mover for us that one oh, yeah. in july you know in 2019 yeah so yeah, there, there's been a lot of steps along the way. We've <laughs> had other deals under contract that have fallen out. We had a 44 unit uh, under contract in Albuquerque that the financing deadline hit right as COVID hit Ooh. and kind of blew up our loan and, or at least looked yeah. like it could have. And we just didn't have enough confidence to stay in and keep our earnest money non-refundable. So we canceled that deal, but we had, I mean, we were $30,000 in due diligence into that thing. And so you know, we're, we essentially did a deal, but didn't close on it. Um, yeah. I yeah. mean, that's, that's why they call it risk capital. I mean, you, you expect yeah, right. to get that back and you do everything you can to, to make sure you're, you're keeping that money, but you know, a lot of stuff happens. You know, we've, we, we've lost some due diligence costs on one, two apartments now. So anyway, it's uh, it happens, it's risk capital and it's, unfortunately the part of the cost of doing business but we we also had a property that uh, we had just when, when COVID hit we had a property with an LOI we were batting the contract back and forth and uh, we hadn't yet put our earnest money down but had, had the COVID closures happened a week later we would have had earnest in a money in a project that we probably would have backed out of too for the same reason lending dried up and if you don't know if you're going to be able to get a loan it's kind of hard to stay in in a deal yeah it, it, like you said it happens it's kind of you know, this is, this business is not for the faint of heart, but you know, there's times that it, it feels like you're, I, I hate to use the word see to your pants, but there's, there's times that it feels like that. Um, mm -hmm. and, and there's times that you feel like you're, you know, you're doing a lot of times you're doing things that you've never done before in business. Yeah. And when you're, especially when you're doing your first deal. And so a lot of times you're kind of winging it and yeah. it takes a personality to do that. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's definitely not for everybody and that's okay like there's nothing wrong with the people that this is not for it takes all of us to make the world go around but yeah now let me let me let me dial in on that one i mean yeah. a lot of people look at the word winging it and think oh my goodness but you had people in your back corner i mean you, you talked about earlier where you had you know part of adam adams inner circle part of Corey peter's mastermind how did those groups help you to to be able to get through those times yeah, well, I mean, just having uh, an experienced mentor in your corner that mm -hmm. has done what you're doing and knows what to tell you to put in the LOI as far as getting a, you know, having a 30 day extension for an additional yeah. earnest money deposit, stuff like that, like things that are going to make your life a lot easier and a lot safer, like mm -hmm. less risky, you know, that's huge. Their presence will give you the confidence, uh, will, will give you confidence, you know, that, mm -hmm that you do have that expertise in your corner and you've got a second pair of eyes really looking at things. Mentors are, are priceless, whatever it takes, honestly, to get in a, in some sort of mentorship mm -hmm. situation, whether it's an unpaid internship with a syndicator or basically you know, bringing whatever value you can to a team. If you're great yeah. at, at word and, and, content creation and and writing and or or videography or photography or underwriting or there's a lot of different things you can bring to a team that are really valuable and whatever it takes to get your foot in the door and 
And sometimes that's like a paid mentorship. Mm -hmm. You know, Michael Blanc has mentorship program. That's like, I think it's 25 grand. It's a year and you get your own mentor for a year. That's a hundred percent focused on you and your success. And mm -hmm. I mean, boom, that's like, yeah, that's, that, I'm actually a graduate of that program and it definitely accelerated. And I, I feel the same way. I had somebody looking over my shoulder who had probably had about 2000 units at the time when, when we started the mentorship relationship and most of the things that we went through where we felt like we were seat of the pants, you know, he was able to just, just to calm us down and say, look, you know, this, this happens, you know, it's happened a couple of times. Here's how you deal with it. Yeah. And uh, I, I think, uh, you know, however you get that mentorship relationship, I'm going to say it exactly what you said, however you can get into that mentorship relationship, it's worth its weight in gold. So let's say, let, let's talk about one of the the deals that you guys have done. Uh, so, you know, pick your favorite, pick the one you learn the most from, whichever. Tell us about one of the deals that uh, Tate's done. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll mention the, the most recent closing uh, mm -hmm. that we, we just had. Uh, it's 179 unit. Uh, community in Mansfield, Ohio, which is a little town about an hour north of Columbus, Ohio. And it's 1970 or so product and or 73 was the, the year I was born. Uh, it, was, nice. it was built. And uh, it's it's really beautiful. It's in a, a wooded environment. It's kind of surrounded by woods. So it gives mm -hmm. you this enclosed community feeling. And it's kind of a rolling hill situation. And there's two parks on the grounds. We're going to make one into a dog area. And it, it was an off-market deal. Came to us through a broker that I had networked with through a childhood friend of mine. She was a residential agent. I went to her and said, we're shopping in Columbus. How can you help kind of thing? And she directed us to this broker. And uh, this broker knows the seller, who's a pretty big player in the Columbus market, and knew that they were looking to liquidate this particular mm -hmm. asset. So we went after it and got it under contract. It was a uh, loan assumption situation. Mm -hmm. So we were assuming a pretty sizable loan, but it was a $9.5 million acquisition. Uh, we had to raise $4.5 million mm -hmm. to bring the uh, equity required and, and uh, some repair money, about 650,000 in uh, CapEx mm -hmm. uh, repair. Uh, and yeah, it's, uh, it, it's just a nice deal. It's, it's basically, these are, are good, nice mm -hmm. floor plans with central air, nothing special for mica, white appliances, but you know, led lighting quality, like everything's up, everything's like updated and, mm -hmm. As we turn units, we'll do LVT floors will be the mm -hmm. biggest change we'll make. And we'll also add what in unit washer and dryers is what oh, our nice. business plan is. So that, that's you know, a when, huge amenity yeah. for, especially like with mothers with small kids, you know, yeah. and you know, my, my wife is a mother with small kids. So having, having the washer and dryer in, in your unit is huge for that demographic. Yeah. Yeah. And it's something that you can capture 50, mm -hmm. 75 extra dollars a month. Uh, you know, a unit mm -hmm. from. So when you do that, in our case, it'll be 120 units because 60 are already done. But yep. yeah, when you do that that many times, that really increases the value of the property. Now, are you guys also renting out washers and dryers? We're actually going to, the, the plan is to provide washers. Oh, provide them. Okay. Got it. Got it. There you yeah. go. Yeah. So that, that that's just an extra boost in money. Not as it's just hookups. I mean, hookups yeah. by themselves uh, are, are going to raise the rents, but hookups with washers and dryers in unit are, you know, even better. So that's, that's nice. So you're getting essentially a washer dryer rental fee with the rent. Yeah. So, okay, cool, cool. Yeah. Yep. So uh, it, it's, it, you know, the couple nice things about it. We, the property manager that's been there the last three years uh, was employed directly by the seller. She is doing a bang up job and is, it has the place really humming um, pretty much 100% occupancy. We, our rents are just low, you know. Mm -hmm. So we we have the opportunity. We're the lowest rents on the block by significant amount. We also mm -hmm. don't charge or we we don't bill back for any utilities, and we've got a wait list. So yeah, you know, she's doing a, a a great job. And the business plan is a three year business plan to take advantage of some organic rent mm -hmm. growth, and uh, also force some appreciation through the washer dryer program and yep. generally upgrading the, the, the place, maybe adding some covered parking. That's a, a mm -hmm. value add that we haven't even underwritten, but 
there's about let's see there's about 250 parking spaces so yep. covered parking is very achievable mm -hmm. um and it's it's kind of like um as far as you know professional achievements go it's um kind of my pride and joy you know it's mm -hmm. the, getting the getting the capital raise done took a team it took you know a, one, a, one of our partners in particular really bringing it and mm -hmm. getting some serious capital raising done and then we had i mean for a third of the capital raise we straight up had a miracle uh, happen for mm -hmm. that you know for uh, what about 1.5 million dollars of the capital raise um, mm -hmm kind of came through the podcast my podcast and and a guy that i that i just had on my podcast he's a dairy farmer in the middle of central pennsylvania mm -hmm. and he's just done very very well Gen you know, fourth generation and has some asset he sold something and had some funds that he needed to uh, deploy and uh you're right there ready he found me he yeah called me and you know there we go so you know, quite frankly, at that point, we were not sure how that was going to wash out. I mean, mm -hmm. I I had faith and, you know, a lot of reason to believe that things would, would go well in the end with that capital raise. But four and a half million dollars is a lot of money to have, you know, yeah. conversations about and have wires done and you know, PPM yes. signed and all that stuff. So it, it's... Yeah, it's huge. So oh, I I understand. Our our largest raise was was four million, and you know it, it takes a while to get there. It it really does, and it's it's a large amount of money. Once you, once you step back, and hopefully you know five to ten years from now, I'll look at a four million dollar raise and be like, <laughs> you know. But uh, but anyway, yeah. Well, congratulations you on getting that will done. Because yeah. I, I what what I've learned and heard and I am starting to find out is that. The more money you're looking to raise, the easier it gets mm -hmm. per dollar, right? So, yeah. and there really are these family offices and and other sources of capital that will not look at an investment less than five million dollars. We hear mm -hmm. that all the time, and yeah. so you know we just put this this three sixty three unit under contract. It's a twenty two point six million dollar acquisition that we'll be raising about eight million for. So. Mm -hmm. We're going to put this theory to the test and yeah. go raise eight million bucks. And I, I've I've talked to a lot of people who you know almost make a living from passively investing, and some of their criteria mm -hmm. is two hundred and above, two fifty and above, you know. So a lot of the a lot of the big spenders, you know, they're they're looking for those larger larger assets. There's there's a little more stability the bigger you get. So, yeah. Yeah. well, that that said, let's uh, look at your big burning why. It's a question I like to ask everybody because I, I think. For me to be able to push myself forward, you know, I always rely on that big burning why. So take, yeah. what's your big burning why? Yeah. So, you know, I, I guess the, the best way to kind of express my why is, is, is just a drive for personal excellence. Mm -hmm. I feel like I owe it to God and the planet and humanity and my family and everybody to be the best version of me that I can be. Mm -hmm. And this space, this in apartment investing space, to me, it's like a canvas for me to develop and like almost do like I look at this business as like my art mm -hmm. and my creation and like what I'm doing with my life. And it's it's my true love. Like, I really do love it. Um, not my only true love, but um, it, you know, <laughs> Ski, it, it, skiing it, was your true love. true love. So, yeah, this is. Yeah. yeah. Um, but so. My big, my big burning why is a vision board full of, you know, some cool things that mm -hmm. material and experiential vacations and, you know, heli skiing and stuff like that. But it's really to have the most impact that I can on other people in a positive mm -hmm. way through being the best version of me that I can be, which includes having an open heart and, and being compassionate and, and being an uplifter. So but be, being highly successful in this space is, I, I guess, an, another tangible way of looking at this is I really want to be a high level professional coach. Yeah. I, I think it'll be specific to this, to the multifamily space when I, when I get into it. I want to coach people, you know, inside of this probably, but I'm not sure about that. I just, I want to make sure that I've got the foundation of success 
that number one builds the credibility that you need mm -hmm. to coach multimillionaires, which is the, the level of yeah. people that I want to be coaching and ha you know, has I, that I have the authentic experience of going through acquiring a hundred million dollars in assets and, and what that takes and, mm -hmm. and being able to teach that to other people. So nice. Yeah. I, Michael Jordan talked about, he just had higher standards than everybody else, you know, mm -hmm. for him, it was, I think that was his big why is he, he, he had kind of that, that vicious competitive, I want to be better than everybody else. And that's not me. Mm -hmm. I, for me, it's wanting to really be like the best version of me that I can be. Okay. I love it. You know? I love it. That's awesome. So, uh, last question and then we'll bring Don on. So what's next for you? Yeah. So I set a goal, uh, last week was my birthday and, uh, I set a goal to get us to a thousand doors in Columbus, Ohio, mm -hmm. and a thousand doors in Oklahoma, mm -hmm. uh, by my birthday next year. Mm -hmm. So we're yeah. And, and slaying, you know, 363 in a shot, you know, you're makes it a lot easier to get there if you're, if you're tackling right. projects that large. Yeah, so. exactly. And it, it forces the issue too. Like, yeah. You know, like, yeah, a 51 unit deal can be good, but is it really like, mm -hmm. is it moving the needle? We are doing a 51 unit deal right now. Yeah, For, uh, forces you to raise the bar on the stuff that you're looking at. And when you look at the smaller deals, you just, they just have to be, you know, a lot more shiny, you know, before yeah. you, you take the effort to, to go after them. So, yeah. all right. Well, that said, we, we got uh, Don on the line. It's been very patiently waiting. And uh, so there we go, Don, welcome. How's it going? Good. Thank you. It's uh, definitely a pleasure and honor to be here with, with both you, Brian and, and Tate. Um, I've been on both of you guys' uh, webinars or, or meetups mm -hmm. at some point in the past. And yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an honor for me, for me, the, my very first podcast uh, interview too. So yeah. it's, uh, it's more of an honor for that too. Yeah. Well, congratulations on your first, first podcast interview. Um, <laughs> Thanks. I, I will say that um, roughly, I think two thirds to three quarters of the aspiring investors, this is their first, first podcast. So, yeah. um, and incidentally, you know, Tate also runs a Salt Lake city based meetup and that's where Don and I met. So, you know, thanks for that Tate. Appreciate it. Yeah. So Don, let's, let's talk about you. Tell us a little bit about your background and history and kind of lead us up into what got you into apartments. So my educational history is more mm -hmm. in, in finance and investment science. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was basically neighbors with Warren Buffett back in Omaha and uh, I was kind of following that path, wanted to get into, uh, you know, more like the financial advisor role at some point. And then of course the 2008 crash happened and all those finance jobs were being laid off and, and they go, I'm like, oh, maybe that's not so secure, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so it got me thinking of different things and um, of course, at the time I was like, man, this would be a great time to, to purchase properties. You know, I had a friend in Florida was mentioning that, you know, houses that were $250,000 are now like $70,000. Like, man, I'd love to be able to do that. But I had no idea how at the time, you know, so mm -hmm. I was like, that, for me, the time real estate was still for the rich people that, you know, have money yeah. to do that. So then not too long after that, you know, our, our kids started growing up and getting into school. And so my wife was looking for something to do. She always been a stay home mom and she wanted to have a job, but we want to have something she's not tied down in case the kids need to, you know, we're sick or what we do during the summer or whatever. So we're looking for flexible jobs and, and, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, some, some reason came into mind uh, about being a real estate agent. So she looked into it and, and, and liked it. So we she kind of followed that path and got into real estate. Um, mm -hmm. So she became a, an, an agent uh, when we were in Omaha. And one of her first uh, clients was an investor. Uh, it was a friend of ours that uh, was able to, to leverage his, his mm -hmm. business and take out a line of credit and started purchasing all these properties, you know, cash basically. And again, it's like, wow, that's pretty cool. I'd like to be able to do that. <laughs> you know? And uh, so along the way, you know, I, I picked up the book, uh, Millionaire Real Estate Investor uh, by Gary Keller and uh, started reading that. So I'd go with her to go do, do showings of properties. I'd sit in the car and just read and, and go through that. And mm -hmm. um, so by about the point where we were like, okay, I want to, I want to try to do this, make something happen. And um, right about that point is where we decided actually we need, we need to move to Idaho. Uh, mm -hmm. We wanted to come out to Idaho to help take care of my mom. Uh, she had MS and was kind of progressing a lot that we wanted to, to get there to be able to help take care of her and, and be there in person for her. Mm -hmm. So kind of left all that to the side for the time being and, and they got everything in order to, to move out here. Um, once we got here, uh, about a year or so later, I kind of got back into it and just happened to, you know, I don't ever watch much TV, but it's happened to one day when I turned on the TV, there was a commercial for one of these uh, real estate seminars, you know, the, mm -hmm. the gurus that kind of go around and I was like, huh, that might be interesting. So <laughs> we went to that and, uh, and I liked it, you know, I was mm -hmm. like, I enjoyed the the information, but yeah, they're, they're like $50,000 program wasn't, <laughs> wasn't going to work for me at the time. I was like, I can't do that. And I don't know if that even, cause it was more of course about flipping houses and like, this is a smaller market. I was like, you know, it might work in big markets, but here there's probably not a whole lot of inventory to, to make that be 
mm-hmm. feasible for these folks for paying, yeah, right? yeah, for paying that much money to do it. So, but uh, with with that through through that meeting, though, I met somebody that uh, led me to Bigger Pockets. Uh, so I got into Bigger Pockets, um, mm-hmm. and uh, just basically fell in love with that right immediately, and and uh, you know joined their pro membership right away because I started using their their calculators and realized that those were a huge asset to be able to analyze properties mm-hmm. quickly and and not you know, that's something up. So yeah, so I got on there and just was listening to their podcasts like daily. Um, you know, I, I've been working for home from home from since mm-hmm. maybe 2014 or so, 2013. And most time I just sit in there listening to music, you know, <laughs> nothing yeah. else to do. So, but uh, once I got in here, it was like when, one day I realized like, you know what, I could probably just listen to podcasts all day. So I started listening to, you know, went back to number one, listened to all the Bigger Pockets podcasts, which then of course led me some other ones along the way that, you know, people mentioned like, um, you know, the Choose mm-hmm. a Five podcast and um, Get Rich Education, all these other things that are all, you know, real estate and, and finance mm-hmm. related. And so I just kind of kept learning along that. And and uh, with Bigger Pockets, they did uh, one time a, like a 90 day challenge, which, you know, I took on that to, to find or purchase your first or next property. Yep. And uh, so I'd, so I'd set the goal kind of like Tate did like by my birthday. I was like, hey, by my 40th birthday, I wanted to, you know, find our first property. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I just kept looking every day and analyzing properties. And, you know, I probably went through like a hundred different properties analyzing and we made offers on a few. And then we finally found one one day actually on Craigslist. It was a, a fourplex mm-hmm. um, about 45 minutes south of here, just outside of Pocatello. And, you know, first my wife was a bit hesitant, but, you know, I looked into, I ran the numbers and was like, this is, this is a great, great yeah. property. Um, so, you know, we went and looked at it in person and, and, um, put an offer and, and we, and we got it. And it was a, yeah. you know, at the time it met like the 1% rules it was. And I knew the rents were under market. Uh, I could get up and, and, and I would self-manage it to help save costs on that. So yeah. From, and from that, it's just been kind of a yeah. going kind of like, you know, I, you guys are, you know, Michael Blanc fans, you know, like one of the things he always would say is like the law of the first deal, you know, so once we get that first one, get over that fear of it, you know, then yeah. I was like, a lot easier. That's, yeah, let's get more right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, so kind of followed that and didn't quite get one right away. After that, you know, we did actually had another one I put under contract, but I didn't quite feel good about it. You know, with the, the counter offer, I had my limit I wanted to go, and um, they wanted more. So like, nah, so I backed out of it. You know, and then a few others that we'd we'd had under contract, but did some inspections, and they, you know, they're kind of older properties that needed some updates. I didn't wasn't ready to, to do, didn't have enough funds available to to take on too much risk. Mm-hmm. Um, so we just kept kept looking, kept analyzing, kept listening to podcasts and, and everything, and, and uh, so kind of like you were saying for for me, like. Um, all these these podcasts really were were my mentor for the most part. You know, I learned so much just from that, and and all the books I'd read along the way. You know, like you say, that, um, the saying you're 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 the sum of total of the people you're, you're around the most. And for me, all these people I was around the most are all these people on podcast. these podcasts that are yeah. experienced, you know, experts. So that's uh, powerful. So yeah. yeah, so it was just helped help my mind, mindset along the way. And yeah, you know, with that, uh, I started looking into uh, other uh, properties. Mm-hmm. You know, I started getting and through this podcast, I'd reach out to a lot of the, the guests and just start mm-hmm. contacting them directly and saying, you know, hey, you know, like what you talked about, um, I'd love to learn more and, and connect. And the, most of them were, were gracious enough to respond back and, and I could make some contacts through a lot of those people and and, yeah. and learn more. Some of them even sent me their, their books, you know, <laughs> so it was pretty cool. It's it's um, amazing to me how few people do that. And so the, cool, yeah. the first time I reached out to somebody was like, oh, my goodness, that, that was a game changer for me. The guy mm-hmm. I happened to reach out to ended up being, you know, one of my informal mentors and helped me get over a lot of my stumbling blocks. I mean, yeah. literally did. And it was just a, you know, I, there's somebody I heard on a podcast. It resonated with me. And I remember I was running at the time and I sweaty fingers tapped out an email to them. And <laughs> uh, um, anyway, yeah. So, so good on you for doing that. But uh, yeah. Well, let's, let's get into your big burning why really quick, and then we'll, we'll turn it over to you for some questions. So uh, if you can distill your big burning why down to, to a couple of sentences, what would it be? So my why, of course, over time, has, of course, has changed. But uh, mm-hmm. for right now, the, this part that is still number one thing would be more to provide a financial future for my family. You know, mm-hmm. Of course, we all want to spend time with them now, but but uh, at some point, you know, if, if I were to pass away like tomorrow, you know, I want to make sure that my family is going to be taken care of and not... Yeah you know, be in a, in a hole and, and, and not know what to do. Cause I've seen that happen. Like when, when my dad passed away uh, in 2003, you know, of course we were all, luckily all the kids were grown, but you know, if we would have been young when it happened, it would have been devastating for, for my mom to yeah. try to take care of us. So yeah, um, absolutely. I want to make sure my fan, my family has some, some source of, of continual income and generational wealth to, to take care of them. Yeah, that's huge. I, I think that resonates Any, anybody who has children that, that that's, you know, top of the list. So well, that said, Don, we got Tate on the line here. What do you want to ask him? Sure. So going back to you know, what I saw about with bigger pockets, you know, I learned how to, to analyze these properties pretty quickly. You know, more for smaller residential properties. But 
is there something similar to like like that, like a rule of thumb type thing um, with apartments where you can do like a quick analysis to even see if it's worth your time to do a full analysis? Well, I, I, I think the best answer to this is that you need to become an, a real expert in your market. You need to know the market thoroughly. So <laughs> so that when something comes up at 55,000 a unit, you know that's smoking. That's I, I know I can put 10,000 a unit into that and <laughs> sell it for 85 or 90 a unit. Like that's kind of a, a rule of thumb. I think a lot of people that are really savvy in their markets use is a price per unit rule of thumb. So that's one. Um, you mentioned the 1% rule a little earlier. Uh, you know, the 1% rule to me is gonna, it sh is gonna tell us whether or not a property is gonna pencil kind of right out of the gate, you know, mm -hmm. if you, and it's not 1%, it's like, usually like one and a half percent or one, one and three quarters percent. Like yeah. that's when a deal is going to pencil and probably, you know, is worth, I want to see what that's going to look like on a spreadsheet. So, yeah. And, and how would you, and I've, I've uh, seen many properties that have been sent to me through the different brokers and oftentimes they don't even tell you what, what they're asking price is or list price. Yeah. They say, you know, here's the properties I'm going to use. Yeah. Yeah. Here's a rent. So basically, you know, they want to see an offer without telling you prices. So how do you, how would you do that without knowing what price they're trying so to get? I would ask them for pricing guidance and I, I'd use that or those words. I would say, can, can you, can you give me some pricing guidance on this asset? Mm -hmm. And they will, they, yeah. they have, I mean, they have to, they, they, if, if they say, well, we're just taking offers that, I mean, uh, first of all, a, a good pro agent isn't, isn't going to just, you know, just leave it completely vague. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I'd, I'd ask for pricing guidance. And, and if you don't get any, I mean, you just, it's, it, it's, I don't, I don't know if it's yeah. worth spending time on or not, Brian, yeah. what, are you, what are your thoughts? You know, on that? I'll go back to, to what you just said earlier, Tate, is you got to know the market. You know, mm -hmm. if you know the market well, and they come out with something without pricing guidance, and you know, the apartment complex down the road just sold at 50 a door, you're probably going to land somewhere around 50 a door. I mean, then you adjust up or down based on what condition it's in, you know, and, and maybe some of the amenities, but yeah. um, I wouldn't necessarily be afraid of something like that. I would definitely do what Tate said first is go ahead and give me some pricing guidance. Um, but if the broker doesn't come back with pricing guidance, I'm going to scratch my head a little bit because yeah. the broker knows the market, the broker knows about where it's going to sell. Yeah. And if the broker can't give you pricing guidance, that may mean the seller has unrealistic expectations or just not communicative or, or something like that. But sure. yeah, first question I ask pricing guidance. And then from there, if we don't get pricing guidance, that's where you rely on your, your market, you know, the, what you know about the market to come up with a, with a price. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, so I guess next question would be what, um, kind of like you mentioned earlier with those, those townhomes that didn't quite work out. Well, but um, so what's what's been one of your biggest learning experiences where you thought you had a a, a great deal, but maybe you misjudged something, made it not being a great deal. But had you known that ahead of time, maybe would have things would have done differently. You would change your price or just skip it out altogether. Yeah, I mean, I I think again, like kind of thirty thousand foot view here is there's a a very real huge amount of risk that you introduce to a project the minute you break ground and mm -hmm. start scheduling all the subs like that it's we call it construction risk it is there's a million moving parts and the person that's pulling the strings and making everything happen has to be great at what they do or things are not going to go well especially on smaller construction projects where you're not going to necessarily be able to get the big guys to come in and do it so man, we, uh, you know, all I can say is we got hammered pretty good on those new builds. And for us, it was a confirmation of what we love about multifamily mm -hmm. and existing apartments, which is, you know, you got cash uh, presently current, currently as it sits, probably ideally profitable asset mm -hmm. that has historic financials and proof that it, of what it's mm -hmm. worth, right? It's totally different than what you're doing with new, a new build project yeah. so for us it really helped us set our course you know yeah sure yeah great right. 
So along, I guess along with that, then is, is there something maybe most people overlook when they're doing their due diligence or analysis, maybe something that uh, people consider not that big a deal, but maybe actually is a big deal to, uh, to not pass over and actually should be spend more time on it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, you, you know, if between physical due diligence and, and uh, legal due diligence on a property, there's, there's an, an awful lot that needs to happen. And I, I don't know that there, I, I don't know that there's one thing that I can think of that people overlook. I think maybe sometimes people may get a little aggressive on, on rent bumps and, you know, rent increases and, and stuff like that. But if there's one common thing that I see often, it's that, but I don't know, Brian, what are your thoughts on that? Do you see one? You know, one, one thing plumbing has, has, yeah come up a lot of times with us, especially if you're doing the, the older stuff, you know, the older the yeah. product it is, the more likely you're going to have plumbing problems. And mm -hmm. we, we've gone into a couple of deals knowing there's pro plumbing problems. And we've gone into a couple of deals, not knowing there's plumbing problems and they pop up later. So, you know, there, there, there's a couple of things that, sewer um, scope. yeah, do it, do a sewer scope, you know, yeah. make, make sure, you know, if the lines are clear, that's, that's a little bit of a peace of mind right there. Mm -hmm. But I, I would just say that, you know, the older the property is, you know, the more fluff you should probably have in your CapEx numbers, you know, especially, you know, even if you do the sewer scope, that's only the main line out to the sewer. You know, there, there's a lot of pipes that are behind walls, a lot of pipes that are underground and inaccessible that you're not going to be able to see. So that's, that's probably the one that we've seen the most is just, just straight out plumbing. Mm -hmm. aluminum wiring you want to stay a million yep. miles away from yep I heard, yeah. I heard a great idea uh with, mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're in a situation where you have to put down hard earnest money mm -hmm. put an aluminum wiring exception into that like oh that's a good idea yeah and there's mm -hmm. a couple others that you can do like there's a couple other like deal breaker type things that mm -hmm. you can put in there as an exception to you know yeah. this earnest money's yeah, not that's a good idea yeah table. We actually have a property under contract that we know has aluminum wiring. It's going to be low six figures to remediate it, you know, and it's, and we're, we're going to do it. I mean, we could not do it and, and pay higher insurance premiums, but when we sell it, we don't want to have to tell the, the next guy coming in that there's aluminum wiring there. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're, we're going to pay low six figures to remediate the property. And that just, you know, pigtails make, make sure all the connections out are, are all with copper. But uh, I think in the long run, we're going to make that money back when we sell it. And yeah. we're going to have a slightly lower expense on our property, on our, um, property insurance. How many it, units is that for a hundred thousand in mitigation? It's uh, 144 units, and it's uh, it's almost a thousand dollars per unit to do it. Yeah. So we're 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 into the low single figure, low six figures. The first number is still a one, though. Yeah. Yeah. So oh, that's good. Nice. Yeah. Cool. That's yeah. That's good. It's great information. Yeah. So I guess Tate, now um, knowing what you know now, of course, as a as an expert, you know, if you were to start over um, as like a newbie, mm -hmm. right? What would be the probably the, the, the biggest or most important thing you could bring to any any team as a GP if you want to get in as a GP like today I see like almost everybody says they can underwrite so there's underwriting is really not that special anymore because everybody apparently does it so I mean is there one thing that you think would be the most valuable to any any team as to come as a GP yeah it's go get a deal <laughs> yeah <laughs> sure yeah. honestly that's I mean if you want to like you know that's the best way to get a deal is, is go get a deal Great and then deal. take it to a team and you know hey guys I've got this deal under contract or an LOI under LOI mm -hmm. or I've got this broker who brought me this deal wherever it is I mean, ideally you put it under contract mm -hmm. or at least under LOI and then Brian's group or Tate's group or Fairless's group or say, you know, mm -hmm. go, go, Michael Blanc has a deal desk. Like you go to those guys and, and, you know, Hey, I've got this deal. I don't, don't necessarily have every, all the pieces to put it together. You know, is it something that um, you'd be interested in partnering with me on, you know, mm -hmm. and, and take whatever percentage you can negotiate, but it, by all means, don't be greedy, especially on the first deal and, and, yeah. and have an agreement that, you get to be involved in the important conversations, the the decision making, uh, or at least privy to the decision making process. And you want to mm -hmm. be copying an email chains and you know, all the, right. all that stuff. Like that's the best way. 
for me, like I, I would, I would just say kind of do the same thing I did, which is get all the specialized knowledge that you can learn how to speak the language, go to the conferences and you know, the three day seminars on how to do the business. Corey Peterson's boardroom is fantastic for that. And Tim Bratz has a great one too. Great two day uh, event that really just, you just learn the business, right? Like, yeah, here's how you write an LOI and here's how you negotiate and here's how you raise capital and here's how you operate. That's going to give you the confidence and the knowledge that you need to eventually go out and build broker relationships, go direct to seller and kind of do whatever it takes to find a deal. Yeah. Yeah. I I would agree. I mean, you you say underwriters, analyzers are a dime a dozen. And that's true. A lot of people have said, Hey, we, we can help you with analysis. You know, we, we've closed on eight properties. We got the analysis thing down. All right. And I, for, for, for me, it's the same thing with capital raisers. You know, someone comes in and says, hey, I can help you raise capital. You know, well, I mean, we, we can do that already. But so for, for different people, I think that they have different needs. I think Tate's absolutely right. If you come in with a deal and you have something with an LOI signed and the numbers are solid, you may have to shop around. You may have to talk to, you know, five or six Tates or Brian's, but somebody's going to take that on. And I mean, the other, I would say the second thing that I would say is, is raising capital. But once again, there, there's a lot of people who can say they've raised cap, can say they can raise capital. And if they've never done it before, I'll, I'll be hesitant to bring them into a GP unless they have, you know, something there to almost guarantee that they're going to be able to hit their marks. So, so just one, one quick follow-up question with that though. I mean, so mm-hmm. getting, getting something under, an L, at least under an LOI, if you don't have the team in place, I know Brian's referred to this before when in his past, when he tried, he tried to get into the large properties, you know, the brokers wouldn't really take him serious because, you know, he had, didn't have that experience behind him. And if not part of a team with the experience, I guess, how would, how would you convince the broker to, to accept your LOI knowing that, you know, you're on your own and yeah, you say you have a team, but you don't. <laughs> so you, you do have a team and you leverage that team. So, you know, put together, oh, it's not within reaching distance. I'd show you my little press kit that I have mm-hmm. that yeah. has my team in it, which now is my team. Mm-hmm. Early on, it was Corey, was my yeah. Corey and his wife and my partner, Carl and myself were my team. And Corey has a $950 million portfolio. So, mm-hmm. and tons of experience. So I leveraged Corey's experience in my, you know, in my business, right? Yep. So in, in, in our structure, he was, he's our expert. You yep. know, so. Yeah, I, I'd say a similar thing. I mean, the, the first call to, a, a, you know, like, like, like we were saying, a Tater or Brian shouldn't be when you have something under contract, you know? So if you're out looking for deals, you know, have, have a bunch of different groups that could potentially help you take it down. And that's what you can talk to the broker about. You're like, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm working with, I, I know I have these guys. I know I have those guys. I know I have those guys, but the credibility kit that Tate was talking about, you know, with, you know, a mentor or a KP or somebody whose pictures on there, who's done a lot of deals yeah. is, is also very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. yeah. one last yeah. little sub note on this whole subject too, I think is so important to know your superpower in the space. Mm-hmm. Like know what you're really good at, know what you like to do, it, because that is the value that you can bring a team ultimately. And it, it, this is such a team sport. You know, you, you go out and get deals with a team in your back pocket and, and, you know, it's and you close deals with a team. All right. That said, we're, we're about out of time. Thank you so much to you, too, for the engaging conversation we've had. Um, one last question for each of you. And Tate, you get to go first. How can listeners learn more about you? Sure. So investwithgreenlight.com mm-hmm. is a good way to find me. Uh, it's it's a, access to our landing page. You can download my new ebook, which is called FIRE, stands for Financial Independence, Retire Early mm-hmm. via Apartment Investing, and kind of helps create the vision for what is possible uh, at a, you know an early age in mm-hmm. life uh, through this activity through this investing, uh, you you can become financially independent. And by that, I mean, paying your bills, paying your lifestyle, you're paying for the lifestyle Mm -hmm. that you want to live passively, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the vision. So yeah, investwithgreenlight.com and then the apartment guys podcast. Awesome. I don't know if 44 is, is uh, old or young, but uh, if that's retire early, I think I'm, I'm in the fire club (laughs) because my, my retirement's coming up in a couple of weeks, but, uh, yeah, you're, 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 it, 
Yeah, I'm ex- so so excited for you, Brian. Yes, by by the time this airs, I I will probably be in my car traveling cross country. You know, Pentagon in my rearview mirror. So um, I'm ex- I'm super excited. But Don, same question for you. How can people learn more about you? The best place is either LinkedIn or Bigger Pockets. I'm, I'm pretty active on both. You can learn learn about me there and see my my content and posts. Um, I also have a, a blog actually I started a couple years ago called uh, CTRFinance.com. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, Charlie Tango Roger for you uh, military guys. Um, <laughs> uh, I kind of started that you know, a couple years ago, mainly geared towards uh, younger people, trying to get them on the right, you know, get some some financial education, um, kind of more heavily geared towards real estate than anything else, but kind of includes other aspects there, kind of created uh, to help my kids and, and in the future, you know, so the people in any any point in their life to want to improve their their financial knowledge and get, reach that fire point through real estate, which I consider the, uh, the shortcut to fires through real estate. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks, guys. And that information is going to be in the show notes. So we'll have a link to Tate's website and his fire financial independent retire early through real estate book and then to Don's blog and website in the show notes. So if you're interested in any of those, check them out. That's it. Once again, thank you to the both of you. And that's a wrap. 